Does God want some to go to hell? So I figured this one will probably take a little longer. Um, this is a good question. Um, who wants to read this one? This is good and pleasing in the sight of God. He wants nice. everyone to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. That's 1 Timothy 2, 3 through 4. <clears throat> and that's verses Proverbs 16, 4. The Lord has made everything for his purpose, even the wicked for the day of disaster. And Romans 9, 18. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy, and he hardens whom he wants to harden. In the notes you uh, emailed out, there's a reference to John 12, 14. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they cannot see with their eyes and understand with their hearts. Huh? Oh, did I say 14? Yeah, 12, yeah. 14, 40. Um, in turn, and I would heal them. That's a right. reference to Isaiah 6. And then mm -hmm. the Isaiah 6 reference is the context is he's not really saying he wants them to be hardened he's wanting them to repent so that they can be the true holy seed that um are loyal to yahweh um but he just knows that they're going to be so hard-hearted because otherwise mm -hmm. he wouldn't have even had isaiah go out and preach because it's at the beginning of isaiah's ministry right so. what, what would be the point of having him go out and preach if he'd already hardened their hearts beyond repair and mark uh in the gospel of mark Jesus references this same passage in chapter four when he's talking about the parable of the seeds. And he, uh, and basically the idea there is, you know, those who have ears to hear are going to draw in closer and be able to listen. But people who just hear the parable and don't take him seriously, it's going to be like the people who are referenced in Isaiah six. But this is a, a serious topic that Christians can, you know, smoke cigars to and talk about at length. Because there's always this idea of trying to reconcile to what extent we have freedom with God's sovereignty. I kind of lean more on the freedom side of things. Mm -hmm. um, different people lean in different ways. It, but, you know, a lot of things that look like a contradiction, I think, are just an invitation to debate. Like, yeah. I think God, like, he calls Israel Israel, which means, you know, he wrestles. He wrestles right. with God. Right, And then uh, whenever God is describing to, uh, he's talking to the other angels in the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says, should I tell Abraham what I'm about to do? The next thing you know, he's telling Abraham what he's about to do. And then Abraham starts debating with him. Well, if, are there 40 people there who are righteous? Are there? And he goes down and down and down. It was like God was inviting Abraham to wrestle with him. Uh, you also just made me think of two passages as well. Uh, Proverbs 1. Let the wise listen and gain instruction, and the discerning acquire wise counsel by understanding the proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. So I point out riddles there because riddles imply things that are not clear on first pass. Something you got to work with and wrestle with, like you said. It's Jeremiah 12, yeah, the first verse says, Righteous are you, O Lord, when I plead before you, yet about your judgments I wish to contend with you. Imagine saying that to God. But the whole point we're trying to make here is that sometimes things aren't clear in Scripture, and perhaps God made it that way so that we will actually wrestle with it. Yeah. No, I think there's something to that. And then, um, well, and it's like, haven't you ever had a hard-headed friend who you gave them advice, but you knew they were going to ignore your advice anyway, but you knew you had to say something to them because mm -hmm. you had you felt like you had a moral obligation to say it's a very bad idea to date this person but you're mm -hmm. like you know they're not going to listen to you but you're still going to tell them what you need to tell them right and so that's kind of how i see it like you don't there doesn't have to be this deterministic control in order for there to be hard-heartedness and you know kind of this essence of determinism in some scenario playing out a friend of mine is actually watching jason dramo uh, he says, interestingly, we have an actual account from Jesus, albeit parabolic form, about this um, eternal separation, the rich man and Lazarus. Yeah. Rich man and Lazarus. You've got Lazarus who was, um, I'm totally going to butcher this story, but he's a poor man. He was begging. He was covered in sores, sick, didn't have much in life, ended up dying. And a rich man who would pass by him and never give him money also died. 
a rich man ended up in, well, Hades, the bad side of Sheol, and then Lazarus ended up in the good side of Sheol, Abraham's bosom. Um, I don't remember what I was going for with that, but it's well, about... I, I, I think, sorry to... No, go ahead. Yeah, so then the rich man, you know, looks looks across the, the great chasm, sees Abraham with Lazarus, and he says, mm -hmm. Oh, Father Abraham, send Lazarus over, uh, let him dip his finger in cool water so he can cool my tongue. Right. And Abraham's like, no, there's this great chasm no one can cross. Mm -hmm. um, and then the rich man then says, well, then send Lazarus back so then he can warm my, what does he say, like, uncle and brothers or something like that you know his family members um his brothers yeah his brothers so that they may not have the same fate as me and then abraham just says do they not have the writings of moses with them right. the line of the prophets you know that's plenty enough and the rich man you know being pretty adamant about what he wants uh abraham to send as just back to the land of the living for says well surely they'll believe if if they see someone from the dead and abraham says they have the writings of the prophets if they're not going to believe those they're not going to believe anything i'm thinking of actually speaking of moses i'm thinking of moses and um, pharaoh because it talks in exodus about god hardening pharaoh's heart and i had heard this from michael heiser where he said that the word used there for harden can also mean strengthen the idea being that God strengthened the heart of Pharaoh, or you could say his constitution, such that he would be able to make it through all of these plagues without being coerced into his decision. So it's like God strengthened his will so that these ten plagues that came across Egypt wouldn't be the thing that just coerces him into following God's will, but he would actually make that choice for himself. I think Let's there's a close see. connection here with divine judgment where mm -hmm. God can judge us by giving, giving us exactly what we want. So exactly. Pharaoh, he doesn't want to release these people even though he's being told to. He's being warned of destruction, and it leads to his own judgment. But you can see this in people's lives like <clears> – <throat> You know, just like in dysfunctional communities where all these people are getting exactly what they want with drugs or prostitution – and their lives are hell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's kind of what I was thinking. Because uh, you know, when you first when you first read these, it, it does sound kind of harsh. But then you realize, like in John uh, twelve, verse forty, where it says, "And turn, and I would heal them." So it, it, he's basically he's basically giving us what we already desire in our heart, like like you said. So the the hardening of our heart could just be reinforcing. The hardness that's already there um so i saw um romans uh 124 where it says mm -hmm. therefore god gave them over to the sinful desires of their hearts um that's kind of what i was thinking of and then and then i noticed like you had mentioned uh christian about isaiah 6 um verse 10 i saw yeah, it's basically that 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 John is is essentially referring to um, Isaiah six, but then I noticed later that in um, Isaiah chapter twenty nine verse eighteen, in that day the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness the eyes of the blind shall see. So it's interesting that even though we were um, we were kind of living in the, the sinful desires of our heart, he sent a way he, he sent us a re, like a a savior essentially and so in that day the deaf shall hear well we know what day that is because jesus mentions it in luke chapter 7 8 uh verse 18 through 23 where they ask him are you the one that um you know where uh john the baptist sent his followers to ask jesus are you the one or are we to look for someone else mm -hmm. and uh and jesus said Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, um, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear. Um, so, and the and the and the poor, um, the poor have good news preached to them. So they're actually doing what God wanted them to do instead of 
turning away from him. Right. Yeah. And instead so, of just keeping their hearts hard, he actually heals them. Right. That that mm -hmm. really what he desires is repentance and uh right. not not to send us all to hell. He wants us all to to turn away from our sin. There's um yeah. go ahead. Yeah, and then in um in Second Thessalonians two, verse eleven and twelve, where it says, Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. The skeptic would say like, see, you know, look at that. God, God deludes people. Mm. I don't even know if that's a word. Um, that is a word. <laughs> but if you read the context of it, uh, the beginning of chapter, or well, chapter two is about the man of lawlessness that is to come, AKA the antichrist. But if you read the two verses right before this quote unquote proof that, you know, God is a deceiver. It says the coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because why? Because God hardened their hearts. No, because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Mm. So they have the out, but like we've been, like we've been covering, you know, the hardness of the heart is already present in man. Right, um, and as Christian mentioned, um, it, it's it's part of divine judgment to have your heart be hardened. You are saying it's like giving them over to that destruction? Yeah, I've even noticed that in my own life. Whenever I'm choosing sin over God, it becomes easier and easier to choose sin, um, and it almost mm -hmm. takes a miracle to even. It, it, and I start trying to even say that the sin I'm doing isn't a sin anymore. Once I'm mm, giving over to it. it. Yeah. And so right. I'm, my, I'm hardening my own heart and then that's going to lead inevitably to destruction because I kind of, you know, I, I don't endorse all of Platonism because I don't understand it. I'm too stupid, but <laughs> I see God as like the ultimate goodness, truth, honor, but also being like existence. And so the further you're going to separate from God, you're going to, you know, not cease existing, but sort of cease existing in a sense. Ce cease mm -hmm. having wholeness, having peace. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, and so the hardness of heart is going to lead to decreation, to put it in biblical terms.